Hello, and welcome to the Overly Animated Podcast, where we take animation seriously. We talk everything animation here, including OKKO, OK which we'll be talking about today. I'm your host, Alex Bonilla, and today I'm joined by Michelle Andrew. Hello! And we are joined by two special guests today. We have here Ian jones Quarty, creator of OKKO. OK Hey! And we have Toby Jones, executive producer and supervising director on OKKO. Okay Hello! We are here today to have a bit of a post-mortem interview. The finale of OKKO OK happened a couple of weeks ago, and we wanted to debrief with uh, with Ian and Toby a bit about the show, get, get some ideas on how it all got started, how they're feeling with how, how the show went, and maybe we can also gush about some things that we enjoyed during the show. Um, you can catch up with our previous OKKO OK coverage at OverlyAnimated.com, and you can find us uh, wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, we always appreciate any ratings and reviews you want to leave us. But yeah, we'll just uh, dive, dive right into it now that we, we have you guys here. Um, I guess uh, we, the natural place to begin would be near the beginning, right? Like how, how OKKO OK got started. So Ian, like how long ago did you have the idea for for the show, for the characters, and that how, how much changes ha- were there from where it got to TV, but from the initial ideas for it? Um, yeah, uh, happy to be here, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Yay! Uh, happy to have Yeah, uh, so yeah, so I'll, I'll, give, I'll try to give the quick version, <laughs> but uh, OK KO, I guess it's been an idea I've had since around uh, 2011, thereabouts. Um, I was working at Cartoon Network. I was a storyboard artist on Secret Mountain Fort Awesome, as well as being storyboard supervisor on Adventure Time. Uh, and they asked me, oh, if I had any ideas for uh, a pilot. And I uh, was was re- I really liked it, the idea of making my own show, but I had never really thought about uh, what I would make a pilot about. So I sat down and I made a whole pitch. Um, it was about aliens, uh, and they traveled around to different planets and stuff, and I pitched the whole thing, and, uh, it just didn't sit right with me, so, like, over one weekend, I just sat down and drew up the whole world of Lakewood and all the characters and started coming up with, like, stories and just general thoughts about it, and I went and I pitched, I, I re-pitched that idea, so, um... I guess that's a lesson in uh, if you have an idea and it sucks, make another idea. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Words to live yeah, by. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Great lesson. Um, and, and, well, you mentioned like aliens. So I guess, like, did Rad, was he, w- would you say Rad was the first existing character then? No, uh, no. This is, this is pre Rad. These were like, yeah. this is, these were like two other random aliens. Okay. This, this whole idea. Uh, I I never cannibalized it for anything else because it was just it was sort of like uh, my e- idea of what I thought would be a good show, but not my mm-hmm. idea of what the show I wanted to make. You were like, oh wait, I already saw the Brothers Flub. Yes, and they got this perfect. <laughs> it was maybe very similar to Brothers Flub. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, uh, Michelle, did you want to jump in with anything? I guess, Ian, I'm just a little curious. What felt so right about Lakewood that didn't feel right about um, the, your alien show? And, like, you've kind of touched on the fact that, like, you thought your first pitch was just, like, this is an idea that I guess maybe an, the network would want to see. Yeah. But Lakewood felt more right to you. Why do you think that is? Well, I think, you know, the main thing, and I think this is important for anybody who's working on an idea, is that you should come up with something that uh, – relates to yourself and also is something that you wouldn't mind extrapolating on for, you know, cause if it's a big idea, you might be working on it for years of your life. The, the thing about uh, Lakewood Plaza Turbo, uh, which was the original name for OKKO is, uh, you know, it was about like kids at a retail job, which I had done when I was, a high schooler, and then it was this whole pastiche of video games and anime and cartoons, which when I was that age working that retail job, that's what I was spending all of my paychecks on. Uh, You know, I literally got that job so I could buy a Dreamcast and so I could buy anime tapes and, you know, so that was like those things were kind of linked in my mind, so it was kind of uh, 
it was uh, it was kind of personal to me. So it was easy to explain to other people why I wanted to do it. Totally. That makes a lot of sense. Just yeah. even watching this show, there's <laughs> uh, when I was trying to feel like, how would you describe like the genre of KO? It's like, well, it's very cartoony. There's a yeah. lot of video games in there. They love anime and they like nostalgia from the 80s and 90s. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because having so much to draw from your old childhood, like that's an endless pool of opportunities. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think, I think, you know, also an idea sh- could, you know, should be something that you want to say about, you know, your own life or your friends or, you know, something like that. And I think OKKO provided that to me and, and yeah, everybody picked up the torch and ran with it. Nice. Nice. And uh, Toby, um, what about you? Like when, when did you come on board with the show and did, did you need to be convinced about it all? Did you jump right in? <laughs> oh, how'd, how'd that go for you? Uh, we were actually just talking about this because we were reminiscing about like the first time Ian told me about the concept. It was like right when you were getting started with it. I, yeah. You were like, yeah, I'm working on this new pilot thing. And I was like, oh, what is it? And you're like, oh, it's kind of like Street Fighter in a shopping center. I was <laughs> yeah. like, that sounds really cool. <laughs> and then, yeah, Ian, I was, you know, uh, Ian and I were friends. And, you know, I was just uh, kind of he was kind of showing me how things were going throughout the entire production of the pilot as it was going. And then, uh a little bit into when you were doing your pilot, I pitched my pilot and did mine. And around the time I finished up mine is when Ian reached out to ask if I could help out with developing the next phases of what was still then Liquid Plaza Turbo. Yeah. And so, no, there was no convincing. I made it very clear to Ian very early. I was like, I love this thing. And, you know, if any way I can help, please let me know. And so that that came a couple, I would say it was maybe a couple years after the pilot. Because, it might have been 2013. Yeah, because you, yeah. you finished the, so 2013 is when the pilot came out, but you'd been working on it for a while. Yeah. And so you were on Steven for a while, and uh, and yeah, it was around that time. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, describing anything as Street Fighter-esque is automatically like, okay. For, <laughs> Already for a win. Cart- for Cartoon Network. Uh, hmm, I wonder how we're going to fit that in. So that, that I, I can imagine that was a very strong opening to that. Um, it's, the, the thing I imagined was a lot harder to draw than the show, because I was like, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I guess, like a Street Fighter character. But luckily the show is, you know. They worked yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, like, once once that got rolling, I imagine, like, you need to pick out, uh, like, a crew of uh, storyboarders and and writers to w- work out your, your story. So, like, Ian, uh, like, what, what goes into that process of choosing who, who you want to bring on? And, like, were you looking for something specific from the people who'd be involved in the show? Well, I just remember, um, you know... One of the things that I had always heard uh, is, you know, you should always sort of look for people who have skills you don't have or mm. like say like you try to find like I remember, uh, you know, several people saying like, oh, I draw, but I want I want artists. I want to work with artists who draw better than me or I want writers who can write better than I can because, you know, you want to find people with skills you don't have. And I think um that's something that Toby and I found pretty naturally working together. Um, so we wanted to find more people who could fit in that. And basically finding those writers is, and artists is uh, basically, it's just like, uh, it's like you have a big auditions, big auditions, you know, you make, you make tests, you send them out. People do like a section of a storyboard and then they send it back to you and you see if you like the writing and the jokes we also interviewed scads and scads of writers, yeah. um, you know, just to see if there was anybody sort of on the same like wavelength. And the thing is, you know, we didn't want to find writers who uh, thought the exact way we did or else it would be kind of an echo chamber. We wanted to find people who um, had different points of view uh, that could make the show uh, more exciting to work on because we'd always we'd constantly be. Um, finding new things to say about the characters, and definitely that that happened throughout the production. It did, and, and that I would even extend that out to to all of the artists and everyone, yeah. even in production. And, and like thinking back to when we first got all the storyboard tests, I remember it kind of came down to like who was surprising us by bringing a perspective on the show that we maybe hadn't considered or expected. It was less about who is bringing us something that is going to fit the box that we've already built of what the show is and more who is going to to make the thing feel more, I guess, um, more interesting, more, more, more diverse. Uh, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and I would say, yeah, and to, you know, to anyone listening who uh, would ever want to work on a cartoon or do something like this, I would say for us, the hugest plus was finding people who had made their own comics or drawn their own drawings or worked on their own cartoons, um, finding those people who are like um, self motivated and already had already have a voice uh, made it a lot easier to say, yeah, you can work on this thing. Yeah. A lot, a lot of the people who we ended up bringing on the show were people who we knew them somewhat from their own personal work, be it comics or, or, uh, or films or anything like that. We, yeah. it was, it was pe- people who already were making stuff for themselves that, that we loved. Were these mostly people that you guys were aware of just through social, social media and not necessarily people who you say worked at cartoon with them? Uh, it was kind of a combination, but yeah. actually a lot of the people, I think most of our original, at least our board crew, were not people from Cartoon Network. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was people we were bringing from other other sources. Yeah. And that it, that just kind of happened. It was a combination of things. You know, if somebody's already at Cartoon Network, they're they're not necessarily going to jump laterally to another show for ar- arbitrarily. Mm-hmm. You know, that's kind of a big decision to make at the studio. And then um, I think that it was a lot of people who – some people we already we were already fans of, and some people who kind of came out and surprised us uh, with, yeah. with their work. But I think we did like for a lot of them, we did kind of go online. And just we're like, wow, we really like this person's work. Let's see if they're interested. For sure. And just cold emailed them, you know. And I think that's you know again for any artist listening, <laughs> uh, if you want to make art, make art already and put it out there because that made it really easy to find people. And be like, hey, maybe this person's interested in working for a cartoon. And we were yeah. pleasantly surprised with a lot of them. And again, that goes all the way from writers to board artists to the art, to the art department. Like yeah. I know that our, our one of our color stylists who, who later became an art director on the show was someone who who I just like liked their work online or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'd, n- I'd never met her or anything like that. And was just like, oh, I love this stuff. And so yeah. we just <laughs> and we're just like, why not reach out and, and, and see if, so if, if see if it could work out? Yeah, because you never know, you know, your your artist out there and someone might see it and be like, hey, I have an opportunity. Sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. But you'll never know unless you put yourself out there. Yeah. And like some some of the initial crew were like our friends, like our producer, Janet, is, was our producer on regular show. And our art director, our original art director, John Pham, was was a friend of mine from mm-hmm. a, from numerous years back in the industry. Yeah. So it was like a combination of like primarily people we like really didn't know that well. Yeah. And, and, a few, and a few people who we, we, we were, were building from previous relationships. Mm hmm. And, and like uh, you can definitely sense it in a show like OKKO, OK especially just the wide variety of styles that that you get like from episode yeah. to episode. So it it really stands out, and like it does speak to kind of a a different philosophy from some other shows, which maybe put a lot more emphasis uh, on consistency. But we we get on the other side like different perspectives. That's also important, right? Totally. I mean, that's 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 so built into the. To just the, the the blood of the show from from day one, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So now, like, we can get a little bit like into the actual like story stuff uh, of the show. Like, was this a kind of show where you had character arcs planned from the beginning, or did they develop as you were in the middle of of the show? Like, it, it seems like we see like Ko and Enid and Rad go through their the different change in characters over the course of the seasons. But like, how how much of that was like from the beginning? How much was like over time, like getting to know them, and, and you figure like this is the natural step. Like, what? what how much planning was there? So we always had the basic idea that there would be arcs for all of the characters, uh, that they would have to end up somewhere, um, that they would all have to grow and change throughout the series. End up somewhere. Uh, when we were in pre, like before we were producing the show, when we were doing the development, we did not have that, uh, entirely planned out. However, we knew we wanted to do something like that. It was when we really started writing the show that we started realizing um, what those arcs would be. Basically, everything before the show was us sort of figuring out the characters, the world, the kinds of things they can do, and then just sort of giving those tools to all the writers and artists. But I would say, like, it was pretty soon in that we discovered... At least the arc for Ko. Yeah, Ko, and then also by extension, uh, season one was a lot of 
KO and what you see in season one. But also very early on, we figured out the initial point storyline. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. Glory days and let's take a moment and then big reveal because you couldn't write an episode like let's take a moment yeah. without knowing exactly what we were going to do in big reveal. And so a lot of that stuff was mapped out very, very early. Yeah. And then some of the other some of the other elements and the other arcs, like, for example, um, like in season two, the foxtail storyline, that that arc that that came a little bit later. Um, but the main like KO and Plaza and Point and, you know, Gar and Carol stuff yeah. was planned out very early. All, all the like history of the character stuff. I mean, that was so early, um, especially like, you know, it, like we messed up. Which is like what? That's episode four. Mm. That has you know that that has the first sandwich flashback in it. <laughs> oh! You know, when we put that flashback in, we knew what the story was. You know that was like us hinting at this bigger story. Yeah, it's 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 actually very much like classic OKKO OK because it was like we're going to put something in where we seed it and we know exactly what it's going to be. But we're going to play it like a joke for as long as possible. Yes. And it has to seem really stupid. <laughs> yeah. And so that's why we made sure there was a sandwich and all yep. of that. I love that. That just like, oh, yes, we're going to put it in as long as we can. Because I remember when we were doing podcast coverage, we see the sandwich at least like four or five times. I think and we I, do four yeah. of them. We, we yeah, milked four, it for all four times. Yeah. And it's like, because I think up until that point, yeah, we I, I hadn't assumed there was anything narratively that was going to grow in the show in a big way because the the whole premise just at face value is very like slapsticky and fun and cartoony um but that sandwich coming back all the time really like it did like kind of change your perspective like oh there is more going on here this is well, like some deep cd flashback stuff yeah gar and gar and carol uh having been members of a team uh that had grown apart and are meeting again here that had actually been an element of OKKO OK since I think like the very first pitch book. Yeah, you sent me like oh. a Bible, like, yeah, like right around the time of the pilot that had a, a version of that storyline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that that had always kind of been in there. I think it was just literally like, I think I called them like, oh, back in their old uh, wrestling superhero days or something. <laughs> yeah, they, like they that. were like, I think they were like hero pro, more like like almost like fire pro wrestling type, yeah. type deal. Back yeah, in, in that. One it was more like I think uh, the pilot was a little more influenced by pro wrestling, um, and Gar and Carol were sort of like, is yeah. it they're all heroes, and just doing fighters is kind of uh, it's kind of generic. So <laughs> heroes lets you uh, come up with like a lot more attributes and and varied uh, characters. Well, at least the wrestling thing carried on their outfits, since I will say, you know, all the point <laughs> outfits are, are very uh, wrestling adjacent. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ab absolutely. That's, yeah, that's that's not a mistake, <laughs> because, yeah, the whole thing's kind of built out of them, yeah, being like the good guys in a team of wrestlers, and yeah. Elbow is like, he's the Mexican luchador wrestler, you know? Yeah. And we know... We know that Foxtail scouted uh, Elbow from when he was doing like underground wrestling. Um, right. That yeah. also influences a little bit of where, yeah. where she came from. Yeah. Okay. And uh, um, you mentioned like a, a thing was stretching out something that was obvious, but if you stretch it out, it becomes funny. Like another thing that's kind of like that, I guess, is uh, con the connection between uh, Laser Blaster Professor Venom, because that was also a thing oh, <laughs> that God. like for a long, long yeah. time. I, I mean, I. I would imagine this was purposeful. That, like the connection was somewhat obvious, but like because it was stretched for so long, by the time it finally gets revealed, like it still feels like, wow, okay, this finally happened. But because of, like stretching it out for as long as possible. Well, yeah, it was almost like making it so obvious that you're like, it couldn't be that exactly. obvious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of brilliant in a way because I like I think like we we. We figured out pretty early on, like, okay, like, this is the same voice actor for all these people. Like, could it? No, that's too, like, that's too easy. It has to be more complicated. Right. So and Sh Shadow we figure, keep... oh, sorry. Yeah, Sh Shadow we figure was, I think, the X factor there that made everybody kind of question themselves every time. Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, uh, honestly, the board artists, I remember, really got into the idea that this is the kind of, um, it's the kind of mystery that a kid could figure out very easily. Uh, and so that 
just made us all really happy. The idea that, <laughs> oh, it's like if you're like a really little kid, you'll understand this and think it's really funny that none of the characters do. Um, yeah, like but- it's, it's funny because like the episode that's called Big Reveal, it is a big reveal, but it's also the first thing you would guess. But then, like, Let's Get Shadowy actually is kind of a big reveal. Like, most, yeah. very few people did guess the actual actual connection with Shadowy mm-hmm. Figure. Yeah. I mean, I saw a few people. <laughs> look, look, there's been, like, it's a, two or three years of theorizing somebody had to, had to land on it. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, um, speaking of, like, uh, these, uh, like, a uh, wide variety of characters that you were able to have on your show... Was did you end up uh, developing a favorite over time, or one that maybe you were um, surprised you enjoyed as much as you did? Well, one of the hardest mm. characters to come up with was Dendi. Oh, yeah, um, like because she was the ah. first. She was like the first major character that we added to the main cast after the pilot. Yep, and more so than just about any other character, we just talked and talked and talked about how she worked what she was like, how she fit into the world and what kinds of stories there would be. Uh, and so like the first, the first and second Dendi episodes, we, we, we rewrote the outlines like four times. Yeah. The first, we did them. the first Dendi episode, we rewrote it several times because we wanted to make sure we were explaining everything we wanted to explain about her character in just one shot. And um, the actual, I am Dendi is like, basically just like a greatest hits of all those ideas, the things we wanted to get across about her. Um, but yeah, Toby, what Toby's saying is true. Cause she's not present in the pilot or anything like that. Um, so it's hard to add a character to a group that has such an established, um, that has such an established uh, like chemistry, mm-hmm. but there was a point where we, I realized that uh, Dendi is uh, like the four eyes character in a shonen manga. You know, <laughs> oh in, in, in any shonen manga, like there has to be a side character that is friends with more, mostly friends with the main character and is more just there to be like, wow, you're so strong, you know, like, wow, this is so great. I'm, I'm obsessed with the main character. Um, and we realized that Dendi is kind of like a tweak on that concept where, mm. you know, she's not obsessed with KO. She sees KO as sort of like a weird uh, experiment and is has is sort of like studying him because he's KO is so like emotionally free and open, which is a thing that Dendi is still trying to figure out. Yeah. So D- Dendi is one example. I mean, I have a fondness for every character Obviously. in the show. I mean, I, I, I love them all. And, but the fun thing about doing a show like this though, is that like the board artists would bring so much every time that the characters would constantly be surprising us with what they could do and what they could be. I think Enid is a really good example of a character where the board artists put themselves into her a lot. And so all the time we were kind yeah. of like every time we were like, wow, there's a really so much to this character and much more than I could ever expect. And I really feel like she, she, yeah, she's one of my favorites as well. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. I can't believe the existence of Dendi is an anime reference, but so, so, such is the way of Okeko. <laughs> she, she's, she's grown more than that. I mean, clearly she's a tweak on that yeah, concept. Yeah. Right. It was something we retroactively discovered. Yeah. We, we discovered it once we like, we're like, where does she fit here? You know, mm-hmm. it's like, ah, she orbits the hero and is kind of like, has her own point of view on that. But yeah, there are just so many characters. So it's hard to even give a real answer. But, um, you know, I would say that, uh, the un- unknowingly to us, the MVP of the side characters would be Droop. Oh yeah. Oh, Droop, Droop really? Droop ended up, yeah. Droop ended up. You know, originally we figured Droop would be kind of one note, but Droop ended up being one of the most uh, diverse and easy characters to put in any situation. And so she, had, she, she grew she, a she, lot. Yeah, she developed as she went, and so if you consider where she was from the first time you see her versus where she ends up, you know, we gave her her like store and everything, and they come yeah. to her for help. Like Droop, actually, she grew like on the sidelines in the background, a tremendous amount. And, and that reminds me a little bit just because of, of those type of characters who start a little more hostile. Uh, I really love uh, what we did with, with Elodie. I feel like she was a really, really, she was a really fun character to write and getting her to grow and then giving her 
unexpectedly control over an entire hero uh, thing <laughs> like yeah. was a lot of fun. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but there are so many different characters who who grow in this show. So it's good to hear that you guys also <laughs> enjoyed seeing that happen before your own eyes. Um, j- just quick, just quickly, uh, Undendi, I need to know who's responsible for the uh, pl- for the stock <laughs> applause noise. Oh, oh, so that started as a gag that uh, one of our boarders, Dave Allegri, would put in his boards uh, whenever Dendi would show up. And uh, it was just really <laughs> funny. So then we just, just we just couldn't stop. We just couldn't stop. Yeah. And it's, you know, and and I've mentioned this before about OKKO. OK but one of the things that we really tried to make sure we preserved on the show is, you know, when the storyboarders do finish an entire board, they present it to the whole crew. And if anything gets a laugh, we try to keep it in the show all the way to the end. We don't have something get a laugh and then cut it because it's too weird. And that was one of those things where it's just like, there's no reason why there should be children's applause here. (laughs) uh, But it's just so perfect that we just kept it. Yeah. It's like, there's a weird thing where you think when you're, when you're making time-based media, there's this adage, which is like, kill your babies. Right. Which Mm -hmm. is like, you have to learn to be a harsh self editor uh, in order to make something truly great. And we were great at that in a lot of ways. But when it comes to jokes, it's like we would kill every other baby in order to make room for something that got a laugh. Yeah. Like yeah. We, we were brutal about that. Like there yeah. was, there are certain episodes that like were like in the animatic stage were almost done. And then we were like, this isn't right. The mm-hmm. jokes, they need to go back. Yeah. And so we would go back in and like tear it apart again to make room for, for the jokes. Cause you know, a lot of that is 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 the personality of the show, and so it needs mm-hmm. the the, t- the, t- the tone and the feel is the most important thing, more so than story or anything like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. that makes a lot of sense. I just want to ask. Now that we're talking about side characters. Where did Creepy Wrinkly <laughs> come from? Because he is amazing. <laughs> okay, this is yeah. Go, well, there's a few different elements, there's a few different elements the, but the first one is okay. So in so. We created a bunch of characters for this show. So many. In fact, we had created about 70 before Before the show even got greenlit. We would just sit in a room and just come up with uh, fun side characters as almost just like a project and a challenge for ourselves. Um, One of the things we liked to do was we would open up the pilot and I had all of the artwork from the pilot as well. And we would just sort of go through so in the pilot, there are a ton of side characters, too. I tried to name every character in the pilot, and I think I got, I named, like, you know, most of them. But there's still even more background characters. Uh, Droop, Potato, you know, all these characters were those rando BG uh, characters. Joe Kappa was one of those. Joe Kappa oh, as yeah. well. Yeah, and, you know, so if you look at the pilot at the part where... um a big crowd forms because there's going to be a power battle. You can see uh, proto versions of all these characters sort of in the background. Um, and one of them was this like hairy wolf dude. Yeah. This- uh, <laughs> <laughs> we were just like, what is this guy? Yeah. We, well, it was like one afternoon we opened up that file and we just named all those characters and came up with who they were. Yeah. And the name, okay, this is, I'm going to completely waste no, your time. No, this is no, all, no, all please, crinkly please wrinkly do. contents is important. <laughs> yes, please. The name crinkly wrinkly comes from an extra feature on a DVD of a feature film I made with my friends when I was in high school. Okay. <laughs> there's, a, there's a feature okay. film my friends and I made in high school called AJ goes to France starring my mm-hmm. friend AJ, who we later made a pilot about. Um, and, we, 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 it was at the time of, of big DVD special features. So we wanted to make a really stupid multi disc DVD for this movie we made. <laughs> and so one of the extra features is called Chin J Goes to France, where we got all of my friends together to do that thing where you, where you draw a face on your chin and you do like, uh, you put the camera upside down okay. and you do like that. And so. One of my friends just improvised this long run about the movie Grunk, Grumpy Old Men, and it ended with him <laughs> saying, crinkly, wrinkly. And that, that's where it comes from. Yeah. Oh, so okay, it was, I love it. It was always kind of connected to being really old and out of it. Yeah. Mm, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. And then as for the character, I can't remember 
<laughs> who brought it to life the most? Well, his first appearance was in We Messed Up, but he didn't have dialogue. He didn't say yeah. anything. I think the first time we wrote him into a story was Legends of Mr. Gar. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Um, but he's one of those characters who the fun is just Bordar started putting him everywhere. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And actually, that's true for like several of the characters. Um, Colwart and Potato ended up in a lot of stories just because they're easy to draw. Um, and Crinkly was just funny. So people would just put him in and just abuse uh, his his weirdness. And then I think eventually, I don't even know why I decided to do the voice of it. I think it was because it was such an unimportant <laughs> character. So, yeah, whatever. I'll do the voice of Crinkly. Really and I remember, I remember at that time you had already played a bunch of characters and you were like, I think I've got one more voice. <laughs> yeah. Like, one, yeah, one more voice in me. One more dis- distinct character. Yeah. And then, of course, Crinkly's other voice is Keith David. But, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. I mean, like, it's kind of true that his catchphrase is, like, I'm everywhere, which is just, I don't know. I mean, you say Crinkly Link is started as unimportant, but he's so visually striking and so weird. It kind of figures, like, he may have life figured out more than the rest of us, honestly. Well, I mean, he there's something. so many jobs. There's something there because, like, of all the characters in the show, he's the one who's there in the, like, theater yeah. of theater of the mind that he KO shows yeah. up at in the final episode and, and Crinkly just wordlessly just like presents yeah. KO with the rest of his yeah. life. <laughs> Crinkly Wrinkly is a time lord. Who knew? Um. Yeah, we don't really know what's going on with him. He's a great yeah. mystery. I think he was a character who we we just, we were like we don't want to do the backstory. Like we don't yeah. want to, we didn't want to go all the way in because we wanted to leave the mystery. Yeah. For and sure. And speaking of like characters that show up in the background a lot, like, do you guys have any, have any other favorite Easter eggs or, or like things you were able to sneak in into the background of, of certain episodes? In terms of like side characters, the thing is, um, they were always all so purposeful. We were never really just putting the characters in mm. just because. Oh, I've got one. Oh. Uh, I Well, okay. This isn't a favorite, but it is like an Easter egg, which is that both Neil and Chip Damage, oh, true. Are, they're both designed off of my childhood character, <laughs> Super Toby. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Uh, and basically, Neil looks kind of like the way I drew Super Toby when I was a kid, and Chip Damage comes from when I asked my friend who was older than me to draw Super Toby like a real comic book character with all the muscles and stuff. Aww. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's what that it comes from. Yeah, they're all kind of, they're both sort of the same guy. <laughs> in, in a way. In yeah. a way. Yeah, chip damage is like Neil 2.0, I guess. <laughs> uh, that checks out. Uh, it's yeah, okay, good. okay. Um, Another character that both uh, me and Michelle enjoy a lot is Botsman, and I, <laughs> oh my God. And I think we want to talk yeah. about Botsman a little bit. Um, I don't know where, where should we start here. Um, I guess just to like his oh. look first, like he's like half robot, he's got like a chicken arm. Um, what 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 Frankenstein process happened to get to Bot- how we know Botsman today? So, so I don't know if I've. Uh put this out there anywhere, but the thing is the first design of Boxman, um, he was like, I mean, kind of like super Toby. He was kind <laughs> of just like a huge, tall, muscly dude. He kind of looked like M bison a little bit. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. The original Bible. Yeah, he's like huge. He's massive. And he was like a super, and he still had like the half, he was, he had like a half cyborg face. Um, he, he, in that, I think he has a cloak over one arm, and it was going to be a reveal that he had, like, one mutated arm. Um, but I, uh, basically what happened was that character was going to be in the pilot, but got cut. Um, there was going to be a lot more uh, stuff in the pilot, including introducing Boxman and all that stuff. But uh, the pilot, instead of being an 11-minute pilot, was a 7-minute pilot. So we had to cut all the Boxman stuff. So in um uh what's it called? Uh thank in in uh in Let's Watch the Pilot, there's a joke that Boxman says, All my scenes got cut. Well, that's oh. actually kind of <laughs> coming this. In the pilot, he would have appeared and he would have been like a, a semi-realistic, super manly cyborg dude. Oh. Um 
But then between the pilot and working on the game, I had um, Lamar Abrams, who currently uh, storyboarder. He was a storyboarder for uh, Steven Universe. Um, he did a round of designs on Boxman, and I was like, I don't know, make him funny. <laughs> and he basically just took all the elements of a super serious, uh, realistic dude and kind of just like shaped them into a little ball. Yeah, it was like uh, a little <laughs> Dr. Wild. Yeah, yeah. And he just made him really funny looking and he that's just where he stayed. Oh my god. I love that Lamar's the one behind his <laughs> design. Because it does add so much to his whole he's so petty and he's so like laser focused on this thing that never accumulates into anything substantial. But he's They're also playful. like kind of brilliant at building things at the same time. Yeah, and yeah, he's he's wonderful, and just is there a reason he has a chicken <laughs> arm? I always my, there, my fake backstory was always that like he experimented on himself, like and making robots as a child, and he had an accident and blew up part of his body, and he had to just like reassemble it with things lying around. But there, what's the true there, story? There is a reason, but uh, I'm not gonna wow. tell you. Wow, this <laughs> <laughs> is gonna haunt me the rest of my hey, life. Hey, look. Uh, you know, say say they try to reboot the show like twenty <laughs> years from now. Uh, we'll do, I will, we'll I, do a feature film that's all about the chicken. Yeah, on. yeah. Oh I want to yeah. give people a place to go with that. <laughs> but, yeah, true. there's totally a reason. Um, but I will say we never intended for uh his his specific backstory to be a part of the story of the show as it is. That wasn't uh, a priority for us. Yeah, we certainly would have gotten there yeah. if we had gotten, you know, five or six seasons. For we, sure. We would have gotten there. But, uh, yeah, it, it was it was kind of a thing that we had set aside a little bit, with the exception of that one episode, Latin Logic. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. Um, but also, like, with Botsman comes Venomous. Like, they, they become, you know, <laughs> together very important uh, later on in the show. And uh, uh, here, here at Overly mm-hmm. Animated, um, we we cover a lot. Uh, we have a, a specific focus on uh, queer representation, and like uh, part part of the interesting thing as the show developed was uh, was seeing like that relationship kind of develop over time. Was that something that was planned out, or or did that like happen upon by a border later on in the in the season? Like, how how did the Botsman Venomous uh, relationship grow with internally? I think we knew we wanted that like from the minute we started writing Venomous, uh, really? uh, into like the um, into like the first uh, what's it called the first uh, outline. Uh, you know, for that episode, we knew that that's what it was going to be. We didn't have a specific, um, we didn't have a specific design for him even when we, when we, when we, uh, did that outline. But, uh, I think we knew for sure that we wanted to, there to be this connection between these two characters. And I mean, I don't know, uh, we're captured is about as blatant as <laughs> yes. someone could be. So I, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of like basically <laughs> the concept for the episode kind of creaked that door open. And then the board that was pitched to us opened that door completely. Yeah. And yeah. then we just dove in from then there for all the, yeah. st- all the stories that followed. It was just like, well, this is what this is. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Who is responsible for like the amazing sequence of Boxman's flexing pectorals and abs yeah. all over the place? That was Parker. It was, was Parker. Parker. Yeah. Oh man! Well, that was the moment I was like, "Whoa, <laughs> this is the first was, season, oh. and this seems pretty clear." Yeah, I mean, you know, we, uh, yeah, we weren't trying to hide anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, and uh, like also like uh, along that same line, like in this show, we have a uh, Joff and Nick. That's pretty early on in the show that we see them together, and then later on, mm-hmm. you get Enid and Red Action too. Like did did you mm-hmm. um did you anticipate the 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 fandom for like uh like I'm 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 not sure how to word this exactly but uh, um like how how well did you think that this was going to be received or did was it like put in the in the background like how, how how was there any special handling to to these relationships? Uh, I mean, there has to be very. I mean, it has to be done very very carefully because. Every time you do it, 
it is a conversation, you know, mm-hmm. with, with, with the network. We, we know, you know, it's, there are things we want to do and that the audience wants us to do. And we're doing those things to the degree that we are able mm-hmm. at basically every step. And so you'll notice that that stuff becomes more overt as the show goes on. And that's because of those things becoming more of, of an open conversation uh, in, in the whole industry as, yeah. as these things go on. I mean, it's literally Steven Universe. <laughs> yeah, that's... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, like, the fact is, yeah, Steven completely opened the door and, and, and laid the groundwork for all this stuff. But I will say, like, uh, Steven did not make it easy. Uh, no, it's still, di- it's still difficult. Because one thing people don't really know is that, you know, let me just say I'm very happy we got to do all this amazing stuff, but it's like, there are, there's always a reason not to do these things. And uh, the people can always provide a reason not to do these things. And Steven is a show that's TV PG, and we're a show that's TV Y7. And people might not know that that's a huge difference, but it actually kind of is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we had to still kind of make a case and, and, and talk about some of these things. Mm-hmm. And to their credit, the network, you know, once it became a more open conversation at a certain point, you know, it was, it was open and, and it was, and it was, yeah. it was free to go, free to go. It was, you yeah. know, <laughs> it, it, it became a conversation until it wasn't anymore. And, you know, all yeah. those were out. Until and also on that, you, you know, um, yeah. so our, our first season was, uh, was a really long first season. It was 52 episodes. And we, um, because of that, uh, we were working on the show for a really long time before it aired, but uh, we were just working on it. So the show premiered on TV in what, 2017? Yeah, 2017. Yes. And we had been working on it as a crew uh, internally since 2015. So we had like over, I mean, we had over a year and a half where we were only working on the show ourselves. And the whole thing of the show, the reason why the show is the way it is, is because we were making the show really for the audience of ourselves and just trying to do what we wanted to do. Yep. Um, which is, you know, why, you know, we weren't kind of thinking about like, oh, our fans or, or, you know, right. reviewers or, or, you know, are people going to see this? What are they going to think? We were really just writing the story as we saw it, um, for so long. And, uh, yeah. And that's why a lot of those things developed the way they did because we just wanted to write what felt right to us. Yeah. The, the internal conversations about, about all these elements were very, 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 very open. And, yeah. and we were all, we were all very much on the same, same page and, 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 and uh, the conversations were, were great. And like to, to go, to go to what Ian was saying about the length of time, it's like we were doing the board pitch for Plaza film festival, I think, which was mm-hmm. like six episodes into season, season two, two yeah. when season one premiered the first episode. Yeah. Yeah. So that gives an idea of how wow. deep, to the show mm-hmm. before we even anyone had seen it <laughs> yeah <laughs> which was yeah which was really fun uh michelle do you have any follow-ups on the, on that well i guess i'll just say um for a lot of these characters like you know enid and red action joff and nick certainly boxman and venomous it's it's just so nice to see the, their feelings towards each other also authentically so early on in a show and like from what you guys are saying like it totally makes sense that it'd be a conversation and you might have to convince some people that it's fine given you know the age group your show is shooting towards um but that it that at, over time you're able to do more things with it but again it's just it's so nice because this show in general just seems like I don't know if you really can presume anyone's orientation is straight right off the bat and that's pretty unique. Um, and it's like incredibly refreshing just because, you know, any kind of media, it's important to have, you know, different, different people with who, who are attracted to other people. Um, but like, I think especially for children's entertainment, like the, the, the trying to make this more normalized and, and helping children feel confident in themselves and feel represented, um, is like extra important. So it's, I'm just like, so glad there are multiple characters because you know sometimes it is just like that one side character who maybe likes their friend and maybe is in love with their <laughs> yeah. friend but they're not the main character they're not one of you know and like well, to have like at least three um groups mm. of characters in relationships is just really it's really nice to see that progression well, well thank you yeah thanks and uh but the tr- the truth of the matter is 
when it comes to the show and when it comes to representation, and this is something I've always pushed for, and it's also something that I learned while working on Steven, is that Mm -hmm. to me, representation is not like a, uh, it's not like a handout. It's not like you're saying like, oh, I'm putting this in so that some people somewhere can feel happy (laughs) or something like that. It's more like about staying true and authentic to the voices of the people who worked on the show, who made the show, our friends and our family and our loved ones and how we feel about them and the reality of that situation. It's more about staying true to, uh, you know, the people creating the show and making the show and running the show uh, because a lot of those people haven't had a chance to tell stories um, about the things that they like or they interested in or their, uh, their uh, experiences. Uh, So for us, that was always the thing that was the most important was um, just saying true to uh, you know, what felt right to us. I think that's a really good point. And I, I will say, I think that's part of the reason that all these characters feel so real and authentic because they, they don't feel like a handout, right? They have internal lives and motivations and they progress. And that's why we root for them and want them to be happy. And the mm-hmm. fact that they happen to be queer, I think it's just so like, you look, they're just, yeah, they're like, just like everyone else. And they, ha- they have a deep internal life. And that's, again, like part of what I'd say would make this show really special in that way. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, and another the thing that the show did was also like include uh, different kinds of families as well, which is also like a, in a children's show, like, it, you know, it's good to have that kind of variety. Like you have Carol being a single mom raising Ko herself. Mr. Gar has to step into the stepdad role and you see the awkwardness going on in that relationship, but it still feels like wholesome and it's not like a, it, it, you can see them both trying to make it work. And then on the other side, you've got like Botsman and Venomous like kind of being dads to, to the to the robot kids and Fink. Yeah. And like you also have like a whole stepchildren dynamic. Absolutely. So like with like all like different kinds of families, like uh, um I guess like how 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 did that go about like incorporating like different people's perspectives on like how different families work? Um well I'll say that from the beginning when it came to that sort of thing, uh, our intention was always to have sort of a chaos eye view on mm-hmm. those things um, and not make those stories too involved and too adult to a place where KO wouldn't understand what's going on, which is kind of why um, Carolyn Gar's relationship kind of happens in the background uh, and KO only sort of has some glimpses into what that is. Uh, for us, it was never our intention to make a story that's specifically, um, you know, uh, having those elements as the main feature. We wanted to make sure that uh, you kind of had a kid's eye view on those things. Okay, yeah, that, that, that uh, yeah, that makes sense with like Ko being the the main perspective here. Um, in our in our outline, yeah. I, uh, Michelle has put down Wilhelmina and Bernard as a family. If you wanted to talk about that, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. which is because I mean, they're you know they're not your typical parents. They're extra cool. They're both really hot, <laughs> as Brad well, points out. Yeah, well, Wilhelmina and Bernard are kind of funny because like they're very unusual, but in a way, that's the most the closest thing to a normal nuclear yeah. family. Yeah, in the show, which is really funny, and you know, we, we just try to make sure that all these all these families, in some ways, are are good examples, well, with with some exceptions, of course, and and you know, some of the situations that Kale mm-hmm. en- ends up in, of course, when what happens when when new people enter your family and things like that, it gets yeah. very complicated. But yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> well, we we got the Wilhelmina content that everybody was clamoring for. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone was crazy. Believe me, look, we would have loved to do another episode with with Wilhelmina yeah. and Bernard. I yeah, think, I will say, like, yeah. that that would have been. We we had we had a, yeah. we had a plan. <laughs> um, are are there any other characters that you feel okay saying that you would have wanted to to do more on if if you'd had the opportunity? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> honestly, it's hard not to say every character <laughs> yeah, right? because 
Because that's honestly the truth. The the first thing that comes to mind, and you're speaking just generally about stuff we wish we could have. Yeah, or just done. Like, or it just in general, like a character that you wish you could have included more of or gotten to use more. Well, that's there's two answers to that. Uh, you know, s- season three, we're incredibly proud with what we did in the show. We we love mm-hmm. we love uh, we felt great about our the way we were able to to give the story time to properly wrap up. And uh, and it was great to see that uh, the audience was was uh, receptive to, to everything we did. Um, the things that had to lose out to make room for that are really just a lot of episodes about the main trio going out on wacky adventures and, yeah. and just being themselves and having and just entering crazy situations as just the main trio as friends. Like we would love to do a lot more. Of, I mean, there's already a bunch of that, but those were the ones that were like. Oh, I wish we could do another of that. Yeah. And then on top of that, you know, it would have been great to have time to, to give Gar a little more spotlight as well. Yeah. I yeah, I would say I would say you know the it's not it's not a regret. It's just we didn't have time uh, to give Gar another just another piece to his arc. Even though we had kind of fully come all the way through with Gar, we wanted yeah. to give him one more thing uh, that we weren't able to do, but. Uh, yeah, the the real the real bummer is that we didn't get to do all of the silly uh, mission episodes. We had a lot of we had a lot of really really good ideas. Um, we were gonna have one of the episodes we really liked was we were gonna see uh, sort of where all the ghosts in the world shop. And what? That, oh yes. <laughs> and that there's like another mall that's like an old uh, indoor mall that's like a ghost mall. Uh, that we would have visited, and we had a really good story for that one. Um, and it, but it was that, just silly. It was just yeah. fun, and like yeah. Arad and Edith get turned into ghosts to yeah. like fight a ghost hunter. It was just stupid. it was just really dumb, and ridiculous that's, stuff. That's the real Bronx cheer episode because they end up shopping. They're trying to shop for a whoopee cushion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kind of thing that's like, and I know that it seems silly to be like, I wish we could have done more with the main characters, but the the dynamic of the the main trio is like the fun thing to yeah. write and see yeah. in the show. And yeah, so, and I, yeah, I don't think it's silly to say that. Since, like, especially in, like, season one, I'd say that, like, the chemistry between the main trio is a big part of, like, what makes that such a fun show to watch, like, seeing them have fun together. So, like, I can totally understand, like, wanting to to add, show more of that even uh, down to the end, right? Yeah, and a, and a lot of, but, yeah, it, it is good because, like, yeah, the reason why we were able to not, you know, necessarily give Gar that next piece is because we had already effectively closed his arc. And series th- uh, season three was a lot of effectively closing arcs. You know, each of those episodes, mm-hmm. you know, Radical Rescue is for Rad. Uh, You're a good friend. KO is for Dendi. Chip's damage is for is for Elodie. You know, throughout the whole season from the very beginning, we're giving characters these final showcases just to show how they've effectively completed their arcs, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, like w- with with final showcases, like you do have the the two finale episodes. Um, like, do do you guys have a favorite part of of those episodes, or like one that you're like really proud of? Oh gosh, I'm a. Uh, I mean, for thank you for watching the show, I'm really proud of uh, like that entire episode, but mostly the montage, which was Mm -hmm. a huge uh, marathon team up of all the boarders on staff, plus me, Toby, Geneva, everybody just like drawing different things. Everybody's kind of taking ownership over different characters and wanting to see their endings and draw that kind of stuff. Um, That was uh, seriously, uh, I've never had a better um, experience working on a crew and, and working on that episode was an absolute delight because everybody uh, pitched in. And then uh, what was really fun is that everybody was kind of doing their own scenes blind. We kind of had just like, we made a spreadsheet and we were like, uh, draw a scene with this character. Someone was like, yeah, I'll draw something yeah. with Cosma. Oh, I'll do this thing. <laughs> right. You know, I'll do one with Shannon. And then we, they were all kind of submitting them separately and we were kind of just bolting them together into this big montage. And then, yeah, a lot of them were things that we had discussed in, in meetings uh, and, and put on a spreadsheet, but, then it, but also a handful of them were complete. Sur- and some of them were in the outline, but then a bunch of them were also complete surprises to us. They just showed up. You know, on the server, and we were just like, "What? Okay, yeah. great." <laughs> and we just put it all. We put it all in, and and you know, 
for you know, for us, we we work on these things for so long and we see them hundreds and hundreds of times. But like that episode still like emotionally destroys me every time I watch. And I've seen, I've seen that episode in particular hundreds of times. Yeah. But like Aww. it's still the the cumulative effect of that of that montage really really yeah. is very it's very difficult for me to watch with a dry eye. Because it's like all the all the characters and all the stuff we ever ever poured into the show and all of our intentions, but then also all of the people behind it and how we all worked uh, really hard uh, mm -hmm. to make this thing. And uh, also the episode is like a celebration of the kind of things that a fan might want to see or know about all of these characters. So it's all kind of like wrapped up into one uh one big one big uh show piece yeah and it's, it's incredibly personal uh yeah. in a way that the show is already very very personal but it's rarely quite so confessional as that episode mm. is. and and you know it was it was a big swing and I'm, I'm very glad that we did it and i'm also very glad that when we handed that concept to the network they were like we understand <laughs> <laughs> Well, it wasn't quite like that. It was actually just like, wow, this is this is really this is really crazy. Yeah. Like, are you guys sure you can pull this off? And we were just like, yes, we are. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was really that was really <laughs> sweet. I mean, I think <laughs> that like all those emotions you guys are talking about, I like definitely it means something much more personal coming from you and your core team who've been with the show for years. But I'd say even as like a casual fan, you really get a sense of how much your team just love this show to pieces and put so much of themselves into it. And I feel like that's honestly the biggest part. A lot of people probably connect to not only for the, the two finale episodes, but just like overall, I mean, like you saying that, Oh, if a joke, if a joke makes somebody laugh, we're keeping it in. We're going to prioritize that joke. that This person's contributing the fact that you wanted all these people with different perspectives to make the show better than you could alone. I mean, it, it is really funny and it really like the style ranges a lot depending on who's boarding an episode. The jokes are really different. I mean, but like it's not hodgepodge in a way that's unpleasant. I feel like it's just it keeps you consistently excited to see like how wacky and interesting it's going to get. But at the same time, like I feel like there's been a really nice balance of like sincerity and emotional depth and you know people growing and changing and having a larger story but having that larger story not necessarily be the the main focus having the characters the trio be the main focus i i don't know i just like it's all really good and i think you guys did a really excellent job with that aspect in particular yeah. thank Thanks. you yeah, yeah. It, it was something that was one of the most gratifying things about working on the show was just never sitting still just always yeah. searching for the next thing that we get really excited about and find really fun and you know we didn't want the the show to be one of those shows where you know season one or maybe the beginning of season two look really interesting and then they kind of fall into a groove where every episode looks the same we wanted mm -hmm. to make sure that all the way from beginning to end you it really it really felt like something that that was made by people which is something we say a lot but it's it was it's still crucial and then yeah. even, even down to the you know the the look of the show you know it was, it was always evolving uh, and it was just us trying to make do everything we could to to make ourselves happy. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I'd I'd like to echo as well. Uh, like, uh, all, uh, although obviously it doesn't rival the emotion that you guys feel like pouring everything into the show. Mm -hmm. But like, even as a as a fan, like watching, thank you for watching the show. Like, it does it does bring out emotion every time that I watch it too. Just like, wow, like this is kind of like the 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 the. the ribbon on top of the like the whole okko OK experience so like it, just because like that feeling is kind of this special on its own so like it, it definitely comes off the the emotion that you guys put into it um spe speaking of like the change from like season one to season three i guess like we can begin wrapping up but like uh by talking about I know this is like asking you to choose your favorite baby, but like, what do you guys have a favorite episode or or like top three of like uh, the work uh, of the work that you did on OKKO? I don't rank things. Toby does, so hmm. he'll, he'll probably <laughs> okay. come with one. Uh, but um, yeah, I don't. I it's hard for me because uh, one of the things really early on, uh, one of the pieces of advice that I got from uh, Penn Ward, actually, um, Penn used to say on Adventure Time to just make sure that every single episode has at least one thing that you that you love in it. And I feel like that was always one of my goals for the series. So, like, every single episode, I can think of, like, one joke or one moment or one weird thing that... 
uh, is so important to me that it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to prioritize, um, you know, so many of them over others. And even the ones where it's like, I felt like, oh, I don't know, maybe we could have had a better idea there. I still look back on them and think, oh, I love that so much. So, uh, but yeah, Toby, you, I think you have some. <laughs> right. I mean, what you're saying is true, though. Like, there are certain episodes where, yeah, like, there's a, at a certain stage in production, I'll be like, ah, oh, I don't know. I don't know if we, I don't know if we did it. And then someone will come to me and tell me that was my favorite episode. Yeah. Like it happens yeah. all the time. It literally just happened to me yesterday. A friend of mine was belatedly working his way through the show. And he's like, I just watched this episode. I loved it. And I was just like, Ooh. <laughs> yeah. uh, really cool. But yeah, I, I'll, I'm just going to read off a handful. Uh, second, yes. first day, one last score. Parents day, special delivery. You have to care. No more pal cards. Thank you for watching the show. Let's not be skeletons. Bittersweet rivals. Season change. Red likes robots. Let's take a moment. Chaos health week. Are a few of my wow, favorites. Wow. That, was, that was a lot in like two seconds. That is the absolute most I could possibly whittle down. Uh, and the fact is that you know I absolutely love uh, Lecky and all, all, all of the episodes because you know we work on each of them for for a year. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so so it, it's it is you know but before I was making a show like this when I would hear creators say like oh they're all my all my babies it's like I was like no way. <laughs> but, <laughs> Now yeah, you understand. It kind of has to be true because you have to make yourself. We have to make ourselves happy while we're working on them. So mm -hmm. we put in things uh, just so that when we see them come on screen, we're like, "Oh yeah, I love, I love this show." Um, and and we've both done that over and over throughout throughout the making of the show. I'm gonna rephrase the question for Ian. What is what is an episode that surprised you how much you liked it? after it was completed that you you weren't like maybe crazy about the entire like you know outline going in but mm. the end product you're like whoa this turned out amazing hmm i would say well i okay i would say one one uh everybody likes rad from season one oh yeah uh, okay was an episode that is kind of unconventional because there's no um, there's no action uh, climax in it. Usually, it was the only time. Yeah, okay. and I think it was the only. It's the only show in the in the series that is like completely. There's no action. Uh, oh, no action climax. or or no equivalent. You know, dynamic uh, yeah. visual exciting sequence of some kind. Yeah, and it was really. That one is really a little more like observational and a little talky. And I remember being like, oh, I don't know how to feel about this one because it's a, it's a little bit of a different tone mm -hmm. uh, for the episode. And then um, once I had seen it all come together, um, I really, really felt like uh, it, it, uh, it, the, the story beats moved really well. And I really just liked the way that the story turned out. And I remember being like really happy uh, with that one once we did like the mix and like the yeah. final watch down of that. It yeah. felt really good. I like that. I like that episode a lot. And there were a lot of times where you were just like, I don't know. I don't know about this one. And you're like, no, it's good. It's good. It's good. Yeah. I don't know. It's good. And, you know, we, uh, we, we put some extra work into it to uh, to make sure it was all working as best it could. And of course, it came from an amazing place. The outline was great. The board was yeah. great. It's just that fun fundamentally, because we didn't include this type of thing that we normally would include in an mm -hmm. episode, it does feel different. Yeah. Um, but I think it's I think it's special. Yeah, and that that happens all the time. You just you take a swing, and then you're like, uh, I don't know, and then you just it just uh, comes together. Uh, just just about every episode that I ever was unsure about by the time of the mix, I was like, this is a complete watchable episode of television <laughs> that that people will enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys have high hopes for a let's watch the botch more box more show? Because that's like, honestly one of my favorite and it's a random episode. And I, I know not everyone's super high enough, but I think it's genius. I love, I love that. I mean, yes. I it was in my list. That episode is extremely uh, personal uh, to me. Yeah. Because it comes from an experience that I had uh, where I stumbled upon a, a YouTuber uh, it was just him and his teenage friend just smoking weed to their webcam and talking and just being just being yes. absurd. And th these videos had zero views, no. zero. And I had stumbled upon them, and I had become the only audience for for these these people. And I had, like 
But you the, had your own like little weird show. Yeah. yeah. I would like leave comments and it would influence what these people would do on the video because I was their entire audience. Oh my god. And and you know, it the it's it's like the episode is a commentary on the feeling of like being a fan of something to the point where you end up like touching the thing and then affecting the thing and yeah. then that ends up feeling bad and, and being a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which, which you know, I think a lot of us can relate to in different ways. Yeah, you kind of regret it, and you almost wish you could just watch it be its own thing, because that would be uh, much funnier. Uh, but that episode, I mean, was was the concept was amazing, and then the board that uh, Dave and Haywan did was yes. uh, one of the funniest uh, boards we ever ever got. I mean, downright hilarious. That is high praise, and I think it is well deserved because there's just something about like the the weird reality showness of watching the Boxmore robots lose their minds. Um, there's, it is there's so good. There's one thing about the episode. This is a very small bit of trivia, but there a, a, there's a sequence. There are several sequences in the episode where we go to Car- Cowboy Daryl at his desk and he's talking. Mm-hmm. And the original animation we got on them. The, he, oh, yeah. he looked a little bit more normal and his hat was more like normal size. Normal size. And it didn't look quite like the board. It looked a little bit more like the model. And he just didn't look nearly as stupid. Yeah. As, the, as, <laughs> as the, he had to be. So we actually she, sent those scenes back. At great expense. Yes. Oh my to make to make sure that Daryl's hat was big and stupid looking <laughs> enough. Yes. And had to redraw all these scenes from yeah, scratch. Yeah. And it was incredibly expensive. <laughs> we'll spend the most money uh, on m- making something really <laughs> dumb. And funny looking, uh, you know, we prioritize jokes and the audience's laughs. That was our that was our job. That's how I I felt that that was our duty, you know, throughout this show. Yeah, I think that's certainly a battle worth fighting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I do briefly want to ask about like the music of the show because the music is pretty iconic. Like I especially love when it like veers into yeah. electro swing and, uh, like uh, recently we got the full release of the theme song after so many years of just hearing the, the 15 seconds in the, in the intro. I'm like, do, do you have any mm-hmm. input into the, into the style of music used on the show or like what, what's your interaction with that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, we've been working with uh, uh, Jake Kaufman and and his studio Mint Potion. I've been uh, they did the they uh, Jake did the score on the pilot, and uh, I always knew I wanted them to work on the uh, full show. And uh, when we were doing the show, um, I specifically requested that we uh, lean into disco um, a little more because I was. I was going through a disco phase at the time, and so was Jake. Uh, so was Jake, and so that made that like very easy uh, for for the two of us. He totally got where I was coming from with the whole thing, and it really worked because um, it's kind of got this like hot blooded but kind of funky sort of edge to it. And there's a lot of places for them to go. Yeah, they spend a lot of time, uh, you know. Like we spend a lot of time every episode, we sit down with the episode and go cue for cue, try to figure out what kind of music goes where and what uh, what is needed in each in each uh, place. And then they take those instructions and go off on them and come up with some really, really amazing stuff. I mean, some of the there's there's some really high marks on some of the things they did outside of um, the. there's the montage and thank you for watching the show, which is an amazing song. And there's all of the insert songs that they did for us. But then also in terms of score, they were able to do uh, some truly incredible things. And I mean, it's a, it's an entire team. If you go to, uh, if you, if you look up mint potion or go to their Twitter at mint potion TV, you can meet all of them and see all the, all the different things that they do. Uh, but They've done some. They've done some truly amazing stuff. Uh, definitely some of my some of my favorites, which I was just like thinking about today, was um, their score for Crossover Nexus was maybe oh, one of the you. most amazing things that they've ever did. I mean, mm-hmm. we literally sat there in in the room, skyping to them and saying, "Hey, you know how Cartoon Network has that thing at the end of their shows?" <laughs> <laughs> Can you take those four notes and turn them into 
a huge Alan Silvestri style <laughs> Avengers wow. theme. And they managed to do it. And it was, uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's true mastery. If you get the chance to uh, go to their website and listen to their OKKO scores and all the other stuff they work on, please do. I mean, Jake and his team are overachievers of the highest order. Like every week we have a new challenge for them and they would just get more excited. Like with, with, with Rad Likes Robots, we were just like, so we want there to be music over every single moment of this episode <laughs> to make it seem like a symphonic operatic thing. And they were like, yeah. Or like for mm-hmm. we, we got hacked. We were like, we want to do like an like a chopping mall synth, you know, uh, horror soundtrack. And they were like, yeah, just every time, yep. uh, every single time they rose, they rose to the occasion. Lord just, Cowboy Daryl. We were like, <laughs> we want to do like a spaghetti Western uh, meets like Dr. Robotnik. And they were oh, like, yeah. totally for it. Um, it was, yeah, it was. We challenged them so much, and they were always up to it, and they did so many amazing uh, pieces of music. And even things like, we'd be like, oh, they're hanging out in the plaza, you can grab an old plaza jam from an old episode. And so often they would come up with a completely new, amazing plaza jam. Yeah. We didn't even ask for it. They didn't have to do that. Yeah. But it, it always made the episodes uh, amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, the, episode, the, the show in general is probably like 15% better than it would have been. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, be- Thanks to the soundtrack. Seriously, like, it, does so much. it adds so much. And there's so many moments that because the soundtrack is just hitting every note right, it uh, just feels so much yeah. better. That's a that's a really good point, actually. I remember um, when I was concepting stuff for the finale promo, um, I was on DAX because, you know, you guys were working on it. It wasn't done yet. Yeah. Um, and I remember, like, seeing it with just, you know, the VO and maybe some scratch sound effects, and that was it. And seeing the final thing with the soundtrack done was, it added so much because, like, the tonal shifts of music just like it highlights character emotions and action and just all these things you don't think about normally but it just goes to show yeah music is very very important it kind of can make or break like visual sometimes yep that's true yeah Yeah. i'd agree like especially like okay ko has so many fight sequences but like a a lot of them are improved because of like the music like fitting perfectly with the movements and stuff so it is definitely a a big shout out to mint potion for uh working on on the show for its for its run um now like i guess to begin beginning to wrap up here like what what are your guys biggest takeaways now that you're done with the show you're now like a couple months when a couple of months separated from it at this point, like, well, what, what's like the bi- the biggest uh, thing that that you're t- taking away with from from that experience? Um, for me, uh, more and more every day, I realize uh, how how uh, how great it was to work with the group of people uh, who were dedicated to uh, having fun with these made up characters um, who, you know we would throw a concept or an idea to, and constantly they would say, I have, I, I get it. And I have a different idea and I can add to this, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, getting to work with who uh, took what we said at good faith and really put a lot of themselves into it. And were unafraid uh, to show who they were through the work. Um, I feel incredibly lucky and happy that I got to work with, so many people to create to to create the thing and also you know the show uh made a lot of my dreams come true <laughs> you know just through doing it and um i feel like it was an amazing uh thing to get to have and i wouldn't have done anything different and uh i'm just excited for whatever's next not just from me but from also from all the people who i worked with on the show who are all incredibly uh creative people i mean you have to remember that uh you know uh victor and valentino you know are that was uh made by one of the season one background artists diego and i love you mau mau that's uh that was parker and then there are several other things uh from people who made the show Honestly, everybody who worked on the show was good enough to have their own thing. And so uh, I'm really excited to see uh, where that all ends up. And uh, yeah, I just feel like, you know, uh, 
my dreams came true, so <laughs> I feel pretty good yeah. about it. Yeah, it's it's like when you're working on a show for so long, you know, it, it represents a lot of different things to you every single day. But when the dust finally settled after it was done, I I had a moment to finally just sit and look back and feel proud. And mm-hmm. that's kind of a state I've remained in increasingly so every day. Every, every day it feels more like an anomaly that something so so wonderful happened in in, in 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 the way that it did. And I just feel proud. And and my my hope is that the effect of the show's existence, you know, and it wasn't a short run. Uh it was actually a pretty long run, as much as I would have liked to have done more. Uh, I, I hope that, and this is echoing a little bit of what Ian said, that what it, what it represents is not a single thing that happened once, but maybe the beginning of of many things that could happen in the future. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, thank you so much for that, guys. That, that was that was very moving. Yeah, that was really nice. <laughs> uh, Mi- Michelle, do you have any <laughs> final questions you want to rip off here? Oh man, probably too many. <laughs> I think. <laughs> um. I did. Did it ever? Does it ever like just seem wild to you guys that you pulled all this off? I mean, like clearly you didn't do it alone, but the fact that you you like made a show and assembled a team, and the show you made is really really good, and you got to do so much with it. Does that ever feel normal <laughs> to you? <laughs> it did when it was happening. Yeah, I, th- I yeah. think that when it was happening because we were so in the weeds of just making it happen. It was like this is my job. It's hard. We're 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 doing this. But yeah, it's kind of like I was saying a little bit earlier. It's like once it was finally over, it's like, whoa, what the? Yeah. What was that? Oh my god. Yeah. Like, of course, like there were times, like mm-hmm. when when Sonic finally happened, for example, when you yeah. when you do stop to be like, whoa. But, yeah. When when we had finished, uh, we had completed the Sonic episode, and that that thing was on the shelf for months before it aired, and knowing that it was like once it was done, once we had finished it, it was done. We liked it. We knew what it was and the audience, we just hadn't seen it yet. Um, that was like one of those crazy moments where we were just like, Whoa, I can't believe we actually pulled that off that, you know, like I actually, you know, got to sit in a room and have the current head of Sonic. Tell me that he likes my Sonic drawings. Um, you know, that kind of stuff was just like mind blowing to all of us. Um, and yeah, there were so many moments throughout the show where it's like, wow, I can't believe we pulled this off. Crossover Nexus was another one. You know, there were so many moments like that, uh, that, yeah, we were just, we were just, uh, really proud of what we did. And it was hard to think about at the time, but, uh, now looking back on it, I'm just really happy we got to make it. And I'm really happy that, um, it found an audience who liked to watch it. And uh, yeah, I, I can't think of a better thing. Yeah. Yeah. Me, 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 Michelle and Steve had a lot of fun talking about the show for a lot, for a long time. And uh, all, all the people who watched the show, I'm sure through the end had, had a, had a really great time with it. So it's, it's nice to hear that you, you also, uh, you guys also have a, Fond fond memories of, of the time now, and we wish you good good luck with your, your whatever you decide to do next. Which I, I guess that hasn't really been decided yet, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm you know we're, we're working on stuff, but mm-hmm. you know uh, we'll we'll see what ends up being the next thing you hear right. about. Yeah, uh, but I will say, and you know, thank you to you and and your team, just because like. You've been there since the very beginning, and like, and like, we've seen that the audience of the show grow a lot uh, in in the in the last few months in particular, which has been great to see. It's been great to see the show seen by a large number of people who are who are kind of reflecting it for what it is and and seeing what we've been making. But yeah, you, you're you, you know, you guys are part of what is actually a a fairly special, not that huge group of people who were there for the entire time and always saw it for what it was and always knew what it was from the beginning. Yeah, it's really true. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, we realized, uh, that we made a show that has a lot of barriers for people to get into it. And if you're not the kind of person who just enjoys something for what it is, for the sake of the thing being what it is, just for the fun of what it is, um, it's hard to appreciate the show, um, in a lot of ways. And so it is a fairly selective group of people who, 
uh, really got the show and talked about it the whole way through. And yeah, you guys are, um, you know, part of that group. So uh, thanks so much, honestly. Uh, you know, like like we've said over and over, it's like you can't take anything for granted. If you have something that you love, uh, yeah. you better get out there and talk about it. Yeah, that, that thing. And that's exactly what you did. <laughs> Uh, th- th- thank you guys. So much. Thank you, thank you, Toby. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Th- th- thank you, thank you, Ian, and thank you, Toby, very much for for joining us uh, today. I- I'm glad we we got to talk a little bit about OKKO okay, for at least one, one more time. <laughs> um, you um, for for those of you listening to to us, um, if you want to learn more about our podcast, you can do that at overtheanimated.com. You can catch up with our OKKO okay, coverage over the years. Um, you could join us on Discord at overtheanimated.com slash Discord, where we do have an OKKO specific channel. Um, a little, a little bit quieter these days, but like there's still, still people, you know, catching up with the show over time. And um, hopefully more, more and more people continue <laughs> to discover it over, over time, you know? Um, that thanks, uh, thanks yeah. to our Patreon executive producers, Ryan, Steve, Beatrice, Hugh, Michael, and Needle. Um, besides OKKO, OK there are also a lot of other shows that we cover here on Overly Animated, so you can also check that out on our website. But yeah, that, 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 that this has been uh, really good, guys. That, that, thank you, Toby. Thank you, Ian, for, for, sh- for showing up and for being able to talk to us for a little bit about the show. We're, we're really happy you, um, you took the, took the time to talk with us. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. <laughs> so on that note, th- thanks for listening, everybody, and we'll talk to you later. Goodbye. Bye.